Did you notice at the end of the gospel lesson that Jesus told this, this individual that he just healed that gave him the ability to hear and the ability to speak to be quiet? Did you catch that? He said, don't tell anybody what's going on. It's, it's like parents when their children are born and, and they can't wait till their children can talk. <coughs> and they wait for that first word. Mom hopes it's mama and dad hopes it's dada or something like that. And then whatever the case is, they're so thrilled that their child is beginning to talk. And then around two or three or four, they're wishing their child would not talk. And Jesus tells this deaf, mute person not to say anything. And what does he do? He is so zealous, so excited, so filled with what God has done for him through Jesus that he can't help but proclaim. Cannot help but proclaim the one who healed him. Do you ever get the feeling that somehow we need healed? Somehow we, we need that healing touch of Jesus. Maybe it's not for our ears. Maybe it's not for our ability to speak, but maybe what we speak or what we hear. That, that we need that healing touch from him that gives us a greater sense of direction and purpose together. Because so often it feels as though we're apart. When we look back to the Genesis story of chapter 3, we discover that great finger-pointing event. And you know what I'm talking about. God comes to the garden once again, and Adam is hiding in the bushes. And God says, where are you, Adam? And, and Adam says, you know, I, I, I realized I was naked. And then, and then God reveals to him that he knows what the problem is. And of course, Adam quickly points the finger. When I play golf with friends and we are playing in a place where you're liable to hit a house with an errant shot, whoever does that quickly turns around and points to someone else. <laughs> That's a good way to see to it that you're not the blame. And of course, Eve then pointed to the snake. And of course, the snake couldn't point at anybody because God had already pronounced judgment upon the snake and the snake had to now crawl on its belly. <clears throat> but of course, we all know who the snake was. The snake is that one who wants to create constant animosity in our lives. Jesus told Satan that between you and the woman, there will be enmity, there will be strife. And between your seed and her seed, that means that between your seed, Satan, and, and all of humanity, there's always going to be strife. And, and that strife will be resolved only through the one who comes, whose heel you will bruise, whom you will cause to suffer, but he will be the one that will crush your head. He will crush your power for eternity. And that's great news. That's grand news. But the, the difficulty is we still live in the between times. The times in which sin still permeates the world and permeates our lives. And that time in which sin will be completely eradicated and we will be present with each other in the very presence of the one who cleanses us. So in between these times, how do we manage? So oftentimes, I think we, we struggle with uh, who, what's good, what's evil, what's right, what's wrong. And, and I learned from a show on TV called Frasier. And, and I discovered one of the reasons why I have found myself in trouble with other people is a statement that he made that I think I've lived in my life. As he was arguing with one of the individuals on his show, the individual was upset with his sternness. And he says, it just shows that I'm passionate and I'm right. 
and I'm passionate about being right. <laughs> Sometimes in order to deal with that sin in our lives that tends to point the finger, that tends to emphasize the differences. Notice Paul was dealing with differences. What we need to do is begin to respect the why. Oftentimes we don't take time to listen to why someone speaks what they speak. Why someone thinks what they think. Why someone approves of one thing and disapproves of another. We often find ourselves not trying to be judgmental, but somewhat judging when someone speaks about something that differs from the way we perceive things, we automatically put them in the camp of something's wrong with you. <laughs> because somehow when I look at the things that I think and the things that I do, I'm right and I'm passionate and I'm passionate about being right. And I need that that hearing aid, I need that touch of God's healing upon my ears so that my listening and my respect of another person's why is heard. Because that's a time that we're listening to a person's thoughts and a person's heart and what really connects with their lives. And that then empowers us, <clears throat> that empowers us to, to focus and redefine the who and the what. Do you notice the three questions in 1 Corinthians? Paul asked three very important questions. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified? And were you baptized in Paul's name? What Paul is saying is, once we begin to respect one another's why, one another's place, one another's differences, and value them and appreciate them, then we can all get together on something that is really challenging, and that is on the who and the what. And the who is to realize that we are baptized in the name. And when knowing that we are baptized in the name, that leads us to realize whose name is planted in our hearts, whose name is, is in our minds, and whose name is to control our directions of life. And the name is the one who went and became crucified for all humanity. That he is the one who went to the cross and said, even though all humanity will continue to point the fingers, even though we will always experience differences, even though we will always have the tumult in life of struggling with how to get along, and that we will have conflicts in life that will continually be a part of us, that he is willing to forgive us for those times when, when everybody else is wrong. And forgive us for those times when we perceive ourselves always right. And knowing that, that he is the crucified one, he then reveals to us that he will not be divided. He is the one that unites. Without Jesus, we'll always be scattered and we'll always be struggling for, the, for dealing with the differences and trying to win our way. But with Christ, we discovered the unity of mind and the oneness of purpose and undivided hearts. Because we've been able to listen to the why and respect one another for those unique differences in our lives. But from that, we're then able to say, but in terms of who and what we're all about, it's all about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. 
No wonder the mission of the church is really simple. It's Jesus' words that we talked about some weeks ago. Go, make disciples. Very simple. And in making disciples, we realize that we're going to grow in faith and build community based upon the name that is greater than any name, the name of Jesus, who was crucified, died, rose again, and ascends on high so that he can rule our hearts and rule our lives. So we respect the why. We redefine the who and the what. And we refresh the how. <clears throat> there was a monk who was asked about all the monks in the community, in the, in the uh, monastery. And he said, tell me, are all of you just the same? And the monk said, well, there's some of us who who are able to meditate all day long, and then there's some people who can't concentrate for more than five minutes. He said, there's some of us who are great scholars, and some of us are almost illiterate. He said, there's some of us that talk a lot, and some who do not talk at all. But the real problem is this. All of us had mothers who fried potatoes differently. It's as though there's this tendency to emphasize the form over the substance. And that's what was happening in Corinth. They were looking at the different leaders and maybe leaders themselves were doing the same thing in terms of this is how I do things or this is how we do things. And so the how got all muddled up in, in which leader did the how the same way that I would do the how. Or the leader might be saying, this is the how and you do my how. And to be able to refresh the how is to be able to go back to Jesus. Go back to the one who established us and said, there's always opportunity to do a how in a way that communicates my love and my grace. Our daughter made these great, great pumpkin bread rolls. They were not rolls, they were loaves. little loaves, yeah. She made about 139 of them, and, and she wanted them perfectly formed to give out to a, a great number of ladies who were going to be at the church that, that she's a part of. And, and she had some that didn't quite turn out the way she wanted it to look. So we got those. <laughs> And I said, you know, I'm hurt. I'm hurt because you give all the best to all your friends over here, and then we get the leftovers. Well, I want you to know they were great gifts because I was able to share them with staff this week. And they weren't concerned about what they looked like or how they looked or what shape they were in. They appreciated the taste. When we taste the kindness of God, it empowers us to respect one another's why, to redefine the who and the what, and to refresh the how. Because what we're all about and who we serve can be done in a variety of ways. And it's done with one mind, one heart, and one soul focused 
on the one that we receive in the sacrament, the body and blood of our Savior. I enjoy, I enjoy with you the variety of loaves that we are and the unity of purpose that God gives us. In the name of Jesus, amen.